reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to Psalm 95. Psalm 95, worship and obedience. This is what they call an enthronement psalm. There are several of them where they acknowledge the enthroning of the Lord as king. We're going to see that there is praise for the Lord's sovereignty, and there's a warning against unbelief. So let's open our hearts, shall we? Father, we ask you to speak clearly to us tonight. Help us to hear what you're saying to us and help us, Lord, to acknowledge that not only are you King of kings and Lord of lords, but you want to be King of our hearts and Lord of our lives. We ask for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a very little psalm, only 11 verses. I'll read it all the way through and then we'll Talk about it for a few minutes. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Powerful, though short psalm. Verse 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. We should sing to the Lord. We sang at the beginning of this service. Hopefully you're singing throughout the week. Do you sing to the Lord? He wants you to sing to him. Well, we sing, but we don't shout, do we? Shouting would be really improper, wouldn't it? We wouldn't want to shout in church, would we? Well, there are many who have said over the years we shouldn't shout. But the Bible says to shout. And we shout at football games and baseball games. Why don't we shout for the Lord? Hallelujah. Shout. Sometimes you get so excited you want to shout about something. Shout about Jesus. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. No matter what you're coming for, always bring thanksgiving. It could be a crisis. It could be a need. It could be a problem. But come with thanksgiving first. Jesus, in the model prayer that he gave, said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He was praising God, wasn't he? Acknowledging God and thanking God. Give us this day our daily bread. Then he got into the petition of it. So when you get into the petition, make sure you have plenty of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is something God deserves. Thanksgiving will also build your faith. Build your faith to believe for even greater things than you know now. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. And so I imagine they must have shouted these psalms at times. And well, they should. Why shout joyfully? Verse 3, For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. He's worthy of it. He's a great God. Do you ever tell him that? You're a great God. You're a really great God. I appreciate you. And you're a great king above all gods, all the gods of 
our own making, the God of self, the God of greed and pride and, and all of that, prejudice. He's above all. There's no other God but him. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. He has the whole world in his hands, as the song goes. And the heights of the hills are his also. It all belongs to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. This whole world belongs to him. And he holds it in his hand. And one day he's going to release it, and it's going to be burned up, and then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth without any sin whatsoever. But it all belongs to him. Verse 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. One of the praise songs uses those words so very, very lovely. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. For we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The analogy of sheep is used quite a bit. David understood it. He was a shepherd. And uh, I suppose in our vanity, we'd like to see, well, Lord, I'm more like a lion. The, the, the biggest, the fiercest, the king of the jungle, Lord. I'm a lion. Well, actually, a lion is used to describe someone, but it's not Jerry. It's Jesus. He's the lion. No, I'm the sheep. And if we could see ourselves as sheep instead of lions, we'd be better off. Instead of seeing ourselves as the fiercest, most powerful around, see ourselves as helpless. Sheep are very gentle, they're docile. Some say they're dumb. And I don't know how dumb they are. We'll have to find out from Ireland. Sadell's sister's got sheep over there and uh, have to see if they're bright or not. But uh, they're, they're gentle and they uh, love to feed and eat and they'll follow the shepherd if the shepherd has strong leadership. So it's really a good picture of what life's all about here. And being a Christian is not all about being strong and powerful in myself. It's about following Jesus, just following him. My late mother, Verna, used to say, you know, it helps as a Christian to be kind of dumb. Don't think for yourself. Just follow whatever he tells you to do. Just the way Mary said at the marriage feast of Cana, to the servants about running out of wine, referring to her son, she said, whatever he says, do it. Just whatever he tells you to do, just do it. That's the key to the Christian life. So, Lord, help us to be more like sheep, the sheep of your hand. Well, actually, everybody's a sheep. But some people are the sheep of the devil's hand, of the world system's hand, of their own hand. Be the sheep of God's hand. There are many different flocks. Make sure you're part of the flock of the Lord Jesus. And then we find in verse 7, a scripture that's picked up by the Apostle Paul. Today, if you will hear his voice, now he's going to be talking about the Jews in the wilderness and their lack of faith. And, and again, this is from Paul's understanding of this. He talks about this in chapter 3 and chapter 4 to of Hebrews. And I, actually, Paul didn't write Hebrews, I don't think, but whoever did write Hebrews picks this up. This is talking about um, not rebelling, but being obedient. Today, if you will hear his voice, when should you hear God's voice? Today. I first heard his voice over 40 years ago, and you have your own testimony. And that's great. But did you hear his voice today? Did you hear his voice this hour? Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, the strife, the contention, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation, and said, it's the people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. For I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. So they were rebelling on a number of occasions. They complained a lot. But I think the writer of Hebrews is certainly talking about the fact that 
It was primarily the rejection of God's promise to enter the promised land. God took them a more circuitous route from Egypt into the promised land. It's a short journey. It's about 14 days if you walk it along the Mediterranean. But there were giants, there were the uh, Amalekites, there were the Philistine giants, there were others, and they were not warriors. And they would have been uh, afraid, they would have run. They weren't ready. So God instead led them for two years down to Mount Sinai to give them the law, the tabernacle, to get them to trust in him. And then at the end of two years, he said, now is the time to enter the promised land. Eh, I don't think so, they thought. I'm afraid. Let's send some spies in and see if it is really as God says. And so they chose one from each tribe and the 12 spies went in there and they came out and they said, yep, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, prosperous, blessed, but there are giants in that land and we are like grasshoppers in our own eyes compared to those giants. We can't do it. Only two of them said we can do it. Joshua and Caleb, they agreed, yeah, we're small. We can't do it, but God can. So Joshua and Caleb said, let's go forward. But the others said, no, they wanted to kill Moses and kill Aaron and go back to Egypt. And so they would just refuse to enter into God's rest, into that promised land. So God said, that's it. Every person of accountability, every man over the age of 21 is going to die in the wilderness and not enter the promised land because you would not enter the rest that I had for you. And so they had what we would call a death march. For the next 38 years, they just marched around and around until finally every one of those men, except for Joshua, Caleb, Moses, and Aaron, were dead. Those were the ones of faith. The rest of them weren't. So don't harden your hearts, verse 8, as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial or contention in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. They saw God bless them again and again, but they still wouldn't trust him. For 40 years, I was grieved with that generation. Can you imagine that? For those 40 years, God was grieved over them. He was disgusted. That's another translation. He was disgusted with them. I wonder how God feels about the unrighteous today and the unrighteous actions going on. I wonder how God feels about my sinful nature, the sinful side of my life and the things that I don't do for the Lord that I should and the things that I omit that I sh should be doing. You think God gets disgusted with me at times? If it's sinful, if it's unrighteous, yes, he does. For 40 years I was grieved or disgusted with that generation. And I said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. That's the essence of sin. It's going astray in your own heart. You know, don't, haven't got, you haven't got the heart of God. You've got your own heart. I did it my way. They don't know my ways. The only way you're going to know God's way is to follow. That sheep will not know the shepherd's way unless it follows the shepherd. So what did God say? I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. You're never going to set one foot into the promised land because you're not trusting me. You'll die in the wilderness. You'll die in your unbelief. Well, let's talk about Jesus for a moment before we close because the writer of Hebrews is talking about that very situation. And he says that we need to be trusting in the Lord. We should not be rebelling. And um, he talks about this in Hebrews chapter 4 as well as chapter 3 as we mentioned. Um, I want to just read a couple of things from Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another today while it is called today, or exhort one another daily while it's called today, 
lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So you see how the writer of Hebrews is paralleling here the psalmist in Psalm 95. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Don't desert Jesus. Don't leave Jesus. While it is said, and here in verse 15, he's quoting Psalm 95. Verses 7 and 8. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. He goes on to say in verse 16 of chapter 3 of Hebrews, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, it was, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They couldn't trust God. You're never going to have rest in God until you can trust him. And he says now there's still a promise of rest. The final rest was not just to get into the promised land. That was rest for them at that time. But he said there still remains a rest, really a more important rest. And that's the rest we have by resting in God through Jesus Christ, his son. So he goes on to say, verse 8, if Joshua had given them rest, if taking them into the promised land was the ultimate and final rest for God, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. But there remains therefore still a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. God worked six days, rested on the seventh. You and I have a choice to do the work ourselves or to do God's work and rest in him. And so we can make that decision, I'll do it my way, I'll do this my way. And it can be ministry. Ministers can make that mistake. I know it's important to do God's work, read the Bible, visit the sick, visit those in prison. And so we can do those things and never really check with God at all. You just know those are good things to do and you just go out and you have your own program, your own schedule, and you just do what you want to do when you want to do it. That's not good enough for God. It's like going into a restaurant and you sit down and the server comes over and the young man or woman says, hi, I'm so-and-so and -so, and that's nice. And I think, well, can I see the menu? And I'm thinking now about, well, forget the menu, sir. I'll take over. I'll bring you what I want you to have. Oh, really? No, I'd like to have the choice here. No, I'll give you what, you, what you're going to get. And that's it. You just sit and relax. Talk to your friends. I'll be back shortly. And that waiter goes out and, and brings in stuff I don't want. I'm not going to be happy. Well, you and I are servants. We're waiters for God. And he wants us to take our direction from him. His mother again said, don't be too smart. Just do what you're told to do. Enter into the rest. Cease from your own activities, your own works, as God did from his. He worked six days, rested on the seventh. Jesus took care of all the work that's necessary to please God. The righteousness, the justice, the power, all of the acceptance that God wants was done in Jesus. I can't work my way into heaven. I can't work my righteousness into God's heart. What I can do is say, Jesus, you did it for me. I take you as my Lord and Savior. I'm resting in you. I'm resting in the fact that you did all that the Father wants. When you said it's finished, you meant that everything that was necessary to bring me into harmony with the Father, to cleanse me from sin, to heal me from every wrong in my life, all that's necessary for my life has been accomplished by you. I'm not working to please God. I'm resting in Jesus. And that's what pleases God. Amen? This is an enthronement psalm. God is enthroned, and one day Jesus will be enthroned throughout the world. Well, you can get a head start. Why not enthrone Jesus in your heart today? 
descend the throne of your own heart. Stop making your own decisions and doing your own thing and instead say, Lord, you be the Lord of my life. You be the king on the throne of my heart. I descend the throne, I give it to you. The enthronement psalm is this day to day, Lord. Be my Lord and Savior. Amen. He's your Savior. You've given your heart to him to get to heaven, but is he your Lord? Is he your king? That's a daily practice. Lord, be enthroned in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. moment your needs to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord as He 